Here's what's going on this week at ALCF. For many people, the holidays can be a very tough season. Each year we come together to purchase gifts for local youth and Angel Tree, a program supporting children of incarcerated parents, and then ship care packages to military troops serving abroad. Stop by the table in the lobby to sign up for training that takes place on Sunday, November 17th from 12 to 1 p.m. in Allies 2 and receive more information about how you and your family can get involved through December 18th. Come join our partners Transforming the Bay with Christ and Thrivent for healthy teams, healthy churches, and learn how to use the talent, passion, and faith of your leadership teams to make life better for people in the Bay. Patrick Lencioni, a pioneer in leadership and business, will provide a unique opportunity to immerse your team in organizational health. This event takes place on Thursday, November 14th from 7.45 a.m. to 12.45 p.m. in the ALCF Sanctuary. If you're new to Abundant Life and want to learn about our story, vision, and values, be sure to join us for our upcoming guest luncheon, This is ALCF. The event takes place after service on Sunday, December 1st from 12 to 1 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Ladies, make plans to attend the women's 12th annual Christmas tea, Emmanuel God With Us. It promises to be a memorable event with great food, praise, and worship by Michelle Lewis and friends, along with a special message from Margie Fennell. This event takes place on Saturday, December 14th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. To sign up for any of these upcoming events, go to alcf.net slash signups or check out the ALCF app. And remember, Abundant Life exists to make a better you for a better world. Let's pray. God, we confess that you are the way and the truth and the life. We recognize, Jesus, that nobody comes to the Father except through you. And so we ask, God, that you would reveal yourself to us today. We have come here to meet with you, and we ask that you would meet with us. As we turn to your word that is living and active, may it not just be words on a page, but may you write it on our hearts. God, I pray in this moment, if if it's just my words, they're just just hypocritical and sinful, but if it's your words, they are life-giving and they are truth and they are life-changing. And so God, I pray in a supernatural way you would speak today, speak through me. Show us who you are. Help us to know who we are in light of who you are, your beloved children. And we pray, God, that that for those who are here who may not know you, that you would give them a sense of what it is that you have done and how you are the fulfillment of every longing of our hearts. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. And you can clap if you want. You don't have to if you don't want to. No, I... You're free, to, you're free to do that. Um, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Isn't it, it, isn't it good to be in God's house? You know what? Even as I say that, this is not my sermon. Even as I say that, I recognize there are some people here today who are like, yeah, actually, it's probably not great this morning for me to be in God's house. I didn't really want to be here. And I just want to say we're glad that you are here. Because there is, there is power in being with God's people and there is power in worshiping God and there is power in hearing from his word. So if, you're, if you weren't really excited to come but you actually did, I just want to affirm you and say we're glad that you are here and we hope that you feel the love of God while you are here. Uh, that said, we have some very special guests in the house today. Uh, my parents are here. This is, this is the first time that they will hear me preach in, in person. And, 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 and we're talking about adultery and lust. <laughs> this should be fun. Uh, I told the group that, that we were praying with before service that really for several weeks I've kind of been dreading this because of what the, the, the topic is. And what's amazing is, is how God's word works 
Because as I've sat with this text for the last week and a half or two weeks and prayed about it and meditated on it, uh, my attitude has changed from kind of like, I don't really want to talk about this in front of a bunch of people, to I think there's a message for us in this and we need to hear it. And so as excited as you can be about talking about these topics, I'm, I'm excited to share them with you this morning. <laughs> Uh, because I think God has a word for us. Now, that being said, I know that there are some children in here, and parts of this message are going to be PG-13. Not because I want to talk like that, but because it's the topic that God has put in front of us today. And so uh, I just want to give you the freedom to get up. We have a wonderful Safari Kids ministry or youth ministry upstairs. Uh, There could be some questions at the lunch table today that you're not ready to answer based on some of the things we're going to talk about in this service. So I just want to give you full warning. If I see you get up in the middle of the service, even if you don't have a child, I'm just going to assume that's why, not that you're bored or offended. So we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. So with that, let's turn to our text. We are in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We're in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 27. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, Cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have titled this sermon, Seriously? And I hope after reading that text, you will understand why I've chosen that as the title. In December of 2016, on the same day, at the same time, a bunch of highly, I hate to use this word twice, but a bunch of highly influential social media influencers, celebrities, models, so on and so forth, same time, same day, posted the exact same thing to their Instagram accounts. It was a video. It was a promotional video for a music festival that was going to happen in 2017. These people had tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of followers on social media. So this word got out quickly. And if you can imagine the video, it was set somewhere in the Caribbean and uh, some very beautiful people were frolicking on the sand and playing in the water and it cut to scenes of uh, some type of concert with lights and smoke. And what it was promoting was a music festival that was going to be the music festival to end all music festivals called the Fire Festival. That's fire with a Y but the name was so appropriate. The Fire Festival promised to be the most luxurious music festival that had ever been thrown. It was going to be on a private island in the Bahamas. There were going to be celebrity, celebrity chefs who created the most delicious food you've ever eaten. There were going to be glamping tents on the beach that you were going to stay in. And if you had enough money, you could get a private villa Tickets sold for between $500 and $1,500 for general admission. For uh, airfare, VIP tickets, and a private villa, those were going for up to $12,000. They sold millions of dollars worth of tickets. The guy who was running this was named Billy McFarland. The problem with the fire festival is that it was a farce. (laughs) There were no luxury villas. In fact, the, the private island was a remote parking lot of a sandals resort on one of the most inhabited islands in the Bahamas. There were no celebrity chefs. There were no glamping tents. In fact, the tents that they had were the leftover FEMA tents from the last hurricane that had gone through the Caribbean. Any band that had committed to playing backed out when they found out what was actually going on. But Billy McFarlane wouldn't tell anyone outside of his inner circle what was actually happening. And so on the day that the fire festival was supposed to start, 500 people, 
millennials, showed up in the Bahamas to no music festival, no food, and tents that had been soaked by the rainstorm the night before with mattresses that were soaked on the floor. Incidentally, Billy McFarland today is in the middle of a six-year federal prison sentence for fraud. He is on the hook for $26 million and has had no fewer than eight lawsuits brought against him. The fire festival went up in flames, but he was unwilling to show the outside world what was actually happening. See, the message of the fire festival is that it looked really, really good on the outside. But on the inside, it was a disaster. That's the message that Jesus is giving us in our text today. Jesus is saying God is less concerned about what's on the outside and he's more concerned with what's on the inside. See, the problem for us is that we are really good, especially in a place like the Bay Area, at presenting a really good outside. We know how to act. We know what to say. We know how to look. We know how to succeed. But the problem, Jesus says, is I don't care so much about what's on the outside. I care much more about what's on the inside. And so, while I have not been super excited about this message, who wants to preach about adultery and lust in front of your mom? I, I, I actually don't think that sex and sexual sin is the main point of this passage. We're going to talk about it because certainly Jesus talks about it and so we need to deal with it just like he does. But as I have sat with this text, I think the deeper meaning, the, the deeper big idea here is that Jesus is telling us the consequences of sin are too heavy for us to treat it lightly. The consequences of sin are too heavy for us to treat it lightly. So before we get into the text, let's just ask the question, where are we? As many of you know who've been coming consistently, we are in the middle of a teaching series on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We're calling it Impossibly Christian. And as you've heard many times already, the reason we're saying that is because as you read this sermon or as you hear this sermon, the sense that you should get is that this is impossible. Who could possibly live up to this standard? And I just want to remind us of that today because the text we are looking at is like Exhibit A for that feeling. When we read these four verses, the sense that we get is, who, who can stand? Who can stand up to this standard? We're going to find out as we dig into it what the answer to that question is. But the other thing that we need to know is that as we have been studying the Sermon on the Mount, the first section we looked at was called the Beatitudes. It's the first 12 verses. And as Brian has said several times, and I just want to remind us, when Jesus goes through the Beatitudes, he is describing the clothing, the distinct clothing that his disciples wear that makes them stand out from the world. It's kingdom garments. What happened last two weeks ago when Brian started teaching on anger, and as we go through this week and through the coming weeks, Jesus has transitioned. Now, he's not talking about clothing, but he's talking about kingdom ethics. He's talking about not do, what do we look like, but how do his disciples live? And the, f the first thing we're going to see in our text today as he's talking about kingdom ethics and how are we to live in this world is that God calls us to a radical approach to sexuality. God calls us to a radical approach to sexuality. Look back at, with me at verse 27, the first verse. It says, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. Now, Jesus here is quoting himself. You shall not commit adultery is a direct quote from the Old Testament. It's from the Ten Commandments. It's the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. And if we remember what Jesus said in verse 17, just 10 verses earlier, this is playing out in real time. In verse 17, Jesus says this. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And we get to verse 27, and he says, especially those of you in my audience who are Jewish, you have heard that it was said, because you know the Ten Commandments, do not commit adultery. And in essence, he's saying, I uphold the Old Testament sexual ethic. 
So what is that ethic? Scholars say in this, in this word adultery is more than just the idea of a married man and a married woman who aren't married to each other getting together. It's the idea of any type of sexual activity outside a man and a woman who are in a committed, monogamous relationship, covenant, that we call marriage. That sounds kind of radical to us today based on the culture that we live in. And similarly, it was kind of radical back then. So presumably, when Jesus is giving this Sermon on the Mount, there are Jewish people listening and there are non-Jews. For those non-Jews, for that Greco-Roman culture, the sexual ethic was this. If you were a man, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted as long as it wasn't with a married woman. If you were married, if you weren't married, whatever you wanted, it goes. Now, if you were a woman, you were expected to be chaste until you got married and then faithful after. So we can talk about the double standard later. But, but for a man in that culture, the ethic was do whatever you want. And here comes Jesus affirming what God said in the Old Testament, and he's saying, do not commit adultery into a, into a crowd that many of them are used to being able to kind of do whatever they want. And that's not that different from our society today. I do not have to tell you, I do not have to make a big, long argument that we have live in a highly sexualized culture. It is everywhere. We become so desensitized to it so quickly. Sex is used to sell accounting software and vacuums. And we just accept it because we're just used to it. It is, it is everywhere. And the prevailing ethic today, I know you've seen this in your places of work and in your neighborhoods and in your social friends, your, your social circles outside of church is you need to follow your heart. If it feels right, do it. The, the commitment to marriage is, is lesser than the commitment to yourself because actually if you restrain yourself sexually, you might do emotional harm. So, so kind of do whatever you want. And, and if you don't believe me, just, just look at what has happened technologically in the last few years. There's an app called Tinder that literally exists to facilitate hookups. It just matches people up who want to get together with no strings attached. There was a, a billboard. I don't know if it's still there because I avert my eyes now. Uh, there was a billboard on 101 South heading down towards San Jose that had two attractive people on it. It said, life is short. Have an affair. And it was advertising a website where you can, you can find people who are looking to have an affair. And if you don't believe me, you can look at the, the slide that they're going to put up. This, there's this website that claims to be the largest website for adulterers in the world. You can't see it. It's in purple. But it says there are 49 million members of this website. Find friendship, online affairs, and cheating spouses. Are you kidding me? Now, maybe they're lying about the 49 million, but, but there are people who are, who are looking for this, right? And, and our culture would say, go for it. If, if that's what you want, if that's what you need, if that's what your heart desires, go for it. But here comes Jesus, and he steps into our world, just like he did 2,000 years ago, and he says, that is not how my disciples are going to live. Jesus says, I uphold the sexual ethic, do not commit adultery. And that still stands true today. And so today, the Christian ethic for sexuality is one man, one woman, inside of a monogamous covenantal relationship called marriage for life. And I know that's not a super popular thought today. And we get ridiculed a lot for that. And I suspect there are folks in here right now when I say that who are like, I'm not sure I agree with that. But can I say I think that's the point because the point of these ethics that Jesus is presenting for his disciples is you are called, we are called to look radically different than the world around us. And one of the ways we look radically different than the world around us is we do our sexuality different than the world does it. Now, if we backtrack 2,000 years back to Jesus, he's sitting on the side of a mountain, he's teaching all these people, when he gets to verse 27 and he says, you have heard it said, you should not commit adultery. You know what most of the Jewish people who are listening to him thought? Yes, I got this one. Finally, 
Finally, he's going to nail all those guys around me who are sleeping around. The Jewish culture at the time, under the influence of the Pharisees, who were maniacal about following the rules, the Jews were really good at following the rules. So there probably wasn't a lot of adultery going on. And they're like, yes, this word is not for me because I got this one. This word is for somebody else. And if I can just get in our business a little bit today, there's some of us this morning who are thinking the same thing. Like, yes, I got this one. I have never slept with anyone except my spouse. Or if you're not married, I'm a virgin. And so I got it. I'm good. This is for everyone else who's sitting around me. This is not for me. But then what does Jesus do in the next breath? You know, because we already read the text. In the next breath, Jesus says, nope, actually, the sin problem is in your heart. We get to verse 28 and Jesus says this. He says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Seriously? Jesus goes and takes what is the outward behavior and says, actually, you are just as guilty of it if it's a heart posture. Jesus takes the outward behavior and says, actually, when it's happening inside of you, you're just as guilty. Who, who can stand? Who, who can stand up to this standard? Now, I, 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 this is where it's going to get just... Um, well, no, not yet. It's not going to get. It's not going to get that uncomfortable just yet. Um, we need to talk about what he's not saying here. Okay, so when Jesus says lustful intent, he is not talking about sexual desire. That is a God-given and beautiful thing, and in the right context, honors him. He is not talking about attraction. He is not talking about noticing somebody's beauty. The Greek word that is translated lustful intent is epithumeo. It means to desire something, but it carries the connotation of setting your heart on something. It's used in Luke in the parable of the prodigal son. When, the prodigal son, when it says of the prodigal son that he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs ate, that's epithumeo. He longed for that. It's also used in the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You know, Lazarus is starving outside the rich man's gate. And it says he, he desired to be fed with the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. So epithumeo, when it's of food, it's not just like, man, I'm a little bit hungry. It is when you are starving, literally, what you think about food. You think that's a healthy relationship with food when you're literally starving? N no. It's all you can think about. You're consumed by it. It's, it's all you could possibly want. And so Jesus is not talking here about the first glance, the appreciation of someone's beauty. Jesus here is talking about the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth glance. He's talking about when we mentally take one of his image bearers, a person made in God's image, and we reduce them to an object for mental gratification. It, I, I would love to crack a joke right now. And maybe I did by saying that. But I want us to feel the weight of that verse. Jesus has just taken an outward act of adultery, which so many of us can say, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. And he has moved it inside to a heart posture. It is with, I, I, honestly, it is with great difficulty that I preach this. Because there is no one as guilty of this in this room than I am. Who, who can stand who can stand before this, before this standard? No one. The answer is no one, and that is the point. The consequences of sin are too heavy for us to take it lightly. My freshman year in high school, a book came out which took the young Christian world, the young adult Christian world by storm. And if you were born anywhere between the late 70s and the late 80s, you are going to know what I'm talking, and, and was in the church, you're going to know what I'm talking about when I say the book that came out was called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. It was by a guy named Joshua Harris. He was 21 when he wrote the book, and its timing could not have been better for me. 
because you might be shocked to hear there were not a lot of girls who wanted to date little Gary. <laughs> and so through high school and into college, when that topic came up, I just said, hey, I kissed dating goodbye. And then my Christian friends were like, oh, so good, man, so good for you, so strong. <laughs> and then I met Beth and I kissed Beth. <laughs> after we got married, after, after we got married. That book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, became the magnum opus for what we now call the purity culture movement. It sold 1.2 million copies. And as you can probably surmise by the title, the idea was we should not date if we're Christians, should look more like kind of courtship and um, more social with big groups and, I mean, really, frankly, a lot of good stuff. And the purity culture at large was brought about in response to how sexualized our culture had become. And the idea was to help young Christians not have sex before marriage. Amazing goal, godly goal, uh, amazing standard. It's the standard that Jesus calls us to. God is the original purity culture. But, but, purity culture fell short. And there are a lot of people today my generation, who would say they were actually hurt by the purity culture movement. Three years ago, Joshua Harris actually came out and renounced his own book, asked the publisher to stop publishing it and pull it from its shelves. What was the problem? The problem was that purity culture, though amazing and good and right in its goals, tended to overemphasize behaviors. And the message of this book is that behavior modification doesn't work. God is not after behavior modification. He's after our hearts. And though we only have to look at the poster child for behavior modification to see this because Joshua Harris, some of you will know this, he spent 17 years as a, 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 church, a pastor of a mega church, highly influential, wrote books. This July, he came out and announced he was divorcing his wife. And then a few weeks later, announced that he was disowning Jesus and walking away from the Christian faith. This is not a bash Joshua Harris moment. My heart literally breaks for him and his family and his children. And as I have worked on this message this week, I literally have stopped and prayed for him. But it is an amazing illustration of what Jesus is getting at in these first two verses, which is this. I care more about your heart than your outward actions. Because when I get your heart, the outward actions are going to flow from it. He is not after, he is not after behavior modification. He is after our hearts. Now this is where it's going to get a little bit uncomfortable. There is, it is not an accident. I truly believe this. It is not an accident that Jesus uses lust and sexual sin as the illustration for this point. Because is there any sin that is easier to hide in our hearts that is easier to do in secret, that is easier to pretend is not going on when we put a good face to the public. And so I just want to hang out here for a minute, not because I want to, but because Jesus has us hanging out here. There is a pornography epidemic in our world, and it is, the church is not insulated from it. If we, if we look at the statistics, and I, I, I thought about throwing them up on a slide, but it, it, we don't need to. We know them. If we looked at the statistics, they would tell us that this room has a lot of people in it who have never slept with someone who isn't their spouse, but who are knee or waist or eyeball deep in an addiction to pornography. You know, if you don't, I'm going to tell you, there is a direct line from pornography to some of the most horrendous things that happen in our world. Uh, divorce, adultery, abuse of women, Abuse of children, human trafficking, all have a direct line to pornography. If that is you, if you are struggling with pornography, I want you to hear first, this is not a place of shame because there is so much shame associated with it and it's why we hide it inside. This is a place of grace and we need to create spaces here where we are free to share the things we are really struggling with because there is always hope. But I also want you to hear this. It is serious. It is serious. It is serious. It is so easy to rationalize it away and say it's not that big of a deal. I just do it when I'm stressed. 
But God is saying, do not take lightly the sin that I call heavy. God is not after you changing your behavior. He's after your heart. And so my word as we talk about sexual sin is this. You should have covenant eyes on your computer. You should be coming to men's huddle. You should be in an accountability group. But you could go to all the accountability groups in the world and it will never clean it up if God does not get to your heart. Do you remember Matthew 5, 8? I preached on it last month. Blessed are what? The pure in heart. Blessed are those whose inside matches their outside. And you all are going to be like, you already preached on this, Gary. But yeah, it's the same message today. We need God to give us a new heart. Ezekiel 37, God says, I'm going to take your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will cause you to walk in my ways. Jesus is not looking for your behavior modification. He is looking for your heart. And when he gets your heart, your behavior will modify. Good? All right. Let's move on. (laughs) Now you're all going to think I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth. And I'm a dad, so I've perfected that skill. (laughs) But I am only doing it because Jesus is doing it. Because the next two verses tell us this. Jesus is saying take radical steps to fight sin. Take radical steps to fight sin in your life. Let's read those together. Verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Seriously? Seriously. Do you remember in Matthew 19, Brian talked about it last week, when Jesus is talking about divorce and marriage, and he says, uh, some people are born eunuchs, some people are made eunuchs, and some people make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. Do you remember what Jesus said? Or what his disciples said, I mean? They say, this is a hard word. Who can receive it? That's how I feel when I read these verses. I imagine if Jesus paused as he's giving this sermon, that one of his disciples, probably Peter, would have just yelled out, this is a hard word. Who can receive it? Jesus is saying, go to war with sin in your life. He is saying, take radical steps to eradicate things that might cause you to sin. Don't rationalize it. Don't justify it. Don't look at what your neighbors are doing or your coworkers are doing or the people in church are doing. Figure out what is causing you to sin and go to war against it. Now, these two verses are basically saying the same thing. It just trades eye for hand, uh, but whatever it is that causes you to sin, get rid of it. And, and some scholars kind of press into, well, 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 here's what he means about the eye. This is what he means about the hand. That's not what we're going to focus on. I want to look at one word in these two verses. It's the last word in both verses, and it is translated in the ESV, hell. In the original Greek, that word is Gehenna. Some English translations actually keep that word. They don't, they don't translate it hell. They transliterate it Gehenna. Anybody ever wondered what Gehenna is? Well, I did, since I'm the only one, I'll tell you, because I, I looked it up. Gehenna is a Latin word. It's a Latin translation of a Greek word that's Gena. Gena is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Hinnom. The Old Testament has several references to the Valley of Hinnom. It is where the Israelites and the wicked Israelite kings burned their children alive in service to idolatrous gods. It was a real place. It is a valley outside of Jerusalem's wall. And in New Testament times, when Jesus is speaking, it is where Jerusalem burned its trash. Does that not open up what Jesus is saying in these two verses? He could just say hell, which is kind of this esoteric, theoretical place. But he says, it is better for you to lose a piece of your body than go to Gehenna. And everyone there is like, that place is horrible. It smells horrible. The fire burns constantly, and I know there were horrendous things done in that valley by our ancestors. It's as if Jesus were to show up today and say, it is better for you to lose an eye or a hand 
than to spend eternity in Auschwitz. And what he's saying in these two verses is that the consequences of sin are too heavy for us to treat it lightly. You don't want to go to that place outside the city walls that smells horrible and burns and has always smoke. So go to war with sin in your life. Now, I want to talk about one more point on these two verses. There has been question historically, is this meant to be taken literally? And some people, you can look it up, have actually taken it literally and have mutilated themselves in response to these verses. I love what the scholar, the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer says about these two verses specifically and the genius of the fact that Jesus does not give us an answer as to whether it should be taken literally or not. Look at these words with me. Bonhoeffer says, Our natural inclination is to avoid a definite decision of this apparently crucial question. That's the question of whether we should take these verses literally. But the question is itself both wrong and wicked. It does not admit of an answer. If we decided not to take it literally, we should be evading the seriousness of the commandment. And if, on the other hand, we decided it was to be taken literally, we should at once reveal the absurdity of the Christian position and thereby invalidate the commandment. The fact that we receive no answer to the question only makes the commandment even more inescapable. We cannot evade the issue either way. We are placed in a position where there is no alternative but to obey. I have a good friend of mine um, who, like many of us in here, has struggled with looking with lustful intent in his life. And one of the ways that he is radically going to war with sin in his life is he uses a dumb phone. Like, like a dumb phone. All he can do is make calls and text. In case you don't believe me, I asked him to send me the picture of it this week. This is, this is 2019. This is a grown man with a wife and children and a real job, a vibrant relationship with God, and he's flourishing. And he has to press the two button three times if he wants to text the letter C. I was texting with him this week and finally he just called me. He was like, it takes me too long. It takes me too long to do the texting. Can I, can I let you in on a secret? He's still alive. <laughs> he's still alive and he's functioning. Highly functioning. He saw an area of his life where he was caused to stumble and he took what to us and to the world out there looks like a radical step to battle sin in his life and do you think when he stands before God and God says, well done, good and faithful servant, he is going to think to himself, man, I really missed out on playing Angry Birds back in that life. <laughs> of course not. He won't think twice about it. So if I can get in your business a little bit, if your iPhone causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to spend eternity with God than playing Angry Birds in Gehenna. Side note, I know there are Apple employees here and Google employees here. I love my iPhone. I am not saying that, that, I'm not saying that smartphones in and of themselves are evil. They have done much to advance humankind. They have done much to advance the gospel. But I am saying, because Jesus is saying it, if you have something in your life that is causing you to sin, cut it out and throw it away. There's some of us in here who we need to go home this afternoon and we need to cancel Netflix or we need to cancel HBO because if Netflix causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. There's some of us who need to go home and toss our TV, if you still have a TV. Go home and toss your TV because if your TV causes you to sin, cut it out. And you might look weird to your neighbors and you might have to actually read a book instead of watching TV at night, but it is not worth the consequence of sin to live with that constantly in your life. Somebody here needs to go home and download Covenant Eyes. It is a filter for your computer. I have it on mine. Every week, my wife and my brother get an email with any questionable web activity that happened on my computer. Go to war with sin in your life. There is somebody here, seriously, there's somebody here who you might need to ask for a job transfer or a demotion because the days and nights on the road are too much of a temptation Better to have less salary 
and a family that is stable than to be on the road sinning. For, for some of you, it, it may not be sexual stuff. Some of us might need to go home and cut up our credit cards. Some of us might need to go home and toss the Xbox or toss the PS, whatever we're on now. Some of us might need to go and end some relationships because every time we're with those people, we end up in places we shouldn't be, doing things we shouldn't be doing. The consequences of sin are too heavy for us to take it lightly. Jesus is calling us in these two verses to go to war with sin in our lives. So the great tension of this text, and I, I, I hope that you're feeling it, is that it's a both and. Because on the one hand, Jesus is saying, you can't clean yourself up. You can't just change your behavior and then become acceptable to me. I need to change your heart for you. But on the other hand, he's saying, find the places that you are sinning and root them out. Take radical, radical steps to avoid it. And right between that tension sits the cross. It's both and, and the cross sits in the middle. As we, as we get ready to finish up, uh, there's a great church father. His name was Origen of Alexandria. We still use his writing today. Legend has it that he actually castrated himself in response to Jesus' words in Matthew 19. Not everyone agrees that, that that's true. If you don't know what that is, uh, email Pastor Brian at ALCF.net. <laughs> uh, if it is true, here's the problem. He still had his eyes. And if he cut out his eyes, he would still have his mind's eye. So, so forgive this imagery, but we could cut out our eyes and our ears and our tongues and our hands and our feet and any other part that might cause us to sin and show up at heaven's gates, bloody stumps, unrecognizable as people, and still not get in because your heart can still be black. Man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. There's good news. There is good news. Uh, the prophet Isaiah, in his description of the suffering servant, spoiler alert, that's Jesus, says that he saw the suffering service, servant cut off from the land of the living. The prophet Daniel in chapter 9 says he saw an anointed one. That means Messiah, spoiler alert, Jesus, cut off and left with nothing. You and I do not need to cut out our eyes or cut off our hands, or cut off our feet, nor do we have to fear being cut off from God because there was one who was cut off in our place. His name is Jesus Christ, and he's the son of God. And knowing full well what was in our hearts, he got up off his throne in heaven, left his father's side, and entered into his creation. Not to come tell us how awful we were, not to rub our noses in our sin, not to tell us to clean ourselves up before it was too late, but to literally suffer the horror of being cut off so that we would not have to. Jesus Christ died on a cross in our place, and in that moment, he was cut off from the Father, and he was cut off from the land of the living so that we would not have to suffer that fate. So my plea with you today is run to him. Run to Jesus Give him your heart of stone and let him give you a heart of flesh. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. And God, we ask now that you would impress this word on our hearts. I pray that you would I pray that you would convict us, God. I pray that you would convict me. And I don't want to be convicted of my sin so that I will take seriously what you take seriously. I pray that you would move in this room now as we head into a time of response, that you would touch people's hearts, that you would give them the sense of your love, the sense of your sacrifice, and give them a longing to love you and serve you with their whole heart and with their whole life. We ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.